and all on behalf of the department of english minapur college i extend to you all all the participants who are present over the other side of this virtual platform today all the academicians the faculty members of different institutions colleges research scholars and students and students of our college you know all that we are organizing this online lecture series since 6th may and we have uh, hosted already uh, uh, six uh, higher 60 plus academician and his renowned professors attended or addressed you so today with us among us we have a renowned academician and professor devran bandopadhyay sir honorable vice chancellor of bakura university who is going to talk on shakespearean sonnets and this is our honor and privilege to have a noted academician like him so to introduce him formally would take a lot of time as he has an illustrious career and he himself is a name as i think but again this is our, our uh, customary to and formal exercise to introduce our research person so before taking charge of bakura university as vice chancellor in 2014 you know all that uh, after taking charge of bakura university and being a uh, resident of bakura i feel proud of bakura university and sir for the initiative that he has taken to make bakura university known to, to the global audience so he took his before taking his charge in 2014 as vice chancellor of bakura university he held numerous official positions and to mention a few he was the head of the department of english and culture studies university of badawan and director of academic staff college he was the coordinator ugc drs program he was the visiting research fellow of university of new south wales and an awardee of the ukd uk and indian research institute of gerontology and honorary adjunct senior fellow in the school of english communication and performance studies monash university australia he had been a fulbright fellow visiting uh, northern elena university in 2013 also uh, australia india and indian india council a uh, fellow in the university of melbourne there is no exaggeration to say that he is a man known nationally and internationally he is also a creative writer his poems have been published in different journals and department of english particularly and minapur college in general feels honor to have your consent to deliver a lecture online squeezing out time out of your busy schedule sir so you we all know that how much you stay busy with your administrative job as the vice chancellor of bakura university so just now you have just returned from the university and that's why we are late uh, for so uh, i uh, feel sorry uh, and i express our gratitude to the audience for their patience so uh, thank you sir one second i i welcome you on behalf of the department of english minapur college to this platform to this online lecture series thank you sir and over to you sir thank you very much uh, for this very wonderful introduction uh um i first of all should begin with a with an apologetic in an apologetic note because uh, i could not make time <clears throat> uh, i was uh, about to begin my lectures at 2:30 but i was ex i got extremely busy at the university uh, so this did <clears throat> i once again apologize for this um i believe that when tonmay kundu from medinipur college contacted me i believe that he was uh, thinking about the students affiliated to bidashagar university and the students of his own college and the surrounding colleges so therefore <clears throat> i decided that i should talk about something 
which is there in the syllabus. And the students should get to know about an area which is very, very much there in the syllabus. So I decided that I should talk about the sonnets. It's very well known. And I know that sonnets are very splendidly taught in the colleges. But I still feel that there should be a, a proper background against which the sonnets should be read. So therefore, in this lecture, there will be two distinctive parts. In the first part, I will discuss the certain background areas and it will be followed by certain very specific areas relating to the sonnets of Shakespeare. So these are the two distinctive areas. Um, let me begin with some introductory remarks about the Elizabethan period. If we very carefully consider this period, which is named after the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, 1558 to 1603, uh, is also remarkable because of the new cultural, political, and philosophical ideologies gradually coming up and establishing themselves establishing themselves in the sense of developing a sense of cultural formation so therefore elizabethan period was a or elizabethan period marked a sharp break with the earlier traditions. Well, let us take up one or two such examples. Let me first of all, as there is not much time, let me first of all concentrate on the Spanish Armada. We all know about Spanish Armada, the battle, the naval battle between uh, England and Spain. But what was the battle really about? In fact, it was a religious battle. A religious battle between the Catholic King of Spain, King Philip II, against the Protestant Queen, Queen Elizabeth of England. And the impact of the defeat of the Spanish armada of the, uh, the, the or the victory of the Spanish armada was immense. Let me just summarize this impact by using a single word, and that is, in fact, individualism. The Spanish Armada is initially looked upon as a, as a religious battle, but it ultimately came to have a very distinctive political implication, socio-political implication that largely stressed the sense of individualism. And the Elizabethan period, the Renaissance as a whole, is a celebration of individualism. It, now, let me refer to Roger Asham, who wrote a book called The Scholle Master in the early 16th century. In that book, we find that there is a sense of 
inferiority, self-constructed inferiority, where Roger Asham says that England has no future because the people of England are the descendants of, I quote, gods and hoods. And again, therefore, the English tradition is barbaric and beggarly, I quote, barbaric and beggarly. It is therefore a challenge against the school of Asham, the tradition of Asham, where Roger Asham is considering the English culture and tradition from a very distinctively negative light. So therefore, I can see that, I can feel that the Spanish armor may be regarded as a negation of the Ashamite tradition of downgrading the English cultural tradition. And it therefore brought about a new political, social, and cultural strength. In other words, it is the reinvention of themselves. They began to, the Elizabethans began to reinvent themselves politically, socially, and culturally. Now, this process of reinvention started even earlier. I am going back to King Alfred. We normally uh, credit King Alfred for his, with his project of translating the great classics of Greek and Latin. But it's not merely the act of translation, but the underlying project of inculcating the spirit of emulation in, in the mind of the English people, the spirit of emulation. Going beyond the Greeks and the Romans, the classics, on the basis of what they have been able to learn from them, that is the spirit of emulation. And I would also refer to the great teachers and the scholars like William Glocking, then Thomas Linacher, then John Collett who began to teach Greek and Latin publicly. And it is in this way, and began to teach publicly, meaning they began to teach the Greek and the Roman language and literature in Oxford and Cambridge. You can easily understand the uh, implication because earlier, these languages and literatures were completely banned. So therefore, Grokin, Thomas Lenacher, and John Collett had once again been reaffirming the sense of English individualism. But not only this individualism of bringing about a fresh spirit in terms of imitating as well as emulating mm -hmm the classics. But critics have again and again suggested that there had been a wonderful mingling, intermingling of the native and the exotic elements. Exotic, exotic referring to the classical elements, the Greek and the Roman influences, and the native elements. The, essential native cultural traditions of Great Britain. That's why they began to use the rich resources of the ballads of Chevy Chase, Robin Hood, Canute songs, and mingling them with the classical traditions and creating a new imagination. So therefore, Renaissance learning actually began to open up wider frontiers of creative activity. 
And let us try to further get into the spirit of change and transformation. In fact, you know, by the Elizabethan period, the world was confronted with a new world order, a new sense of order. The feudalistic system based on the hierarchic formation of the church, placed at the peak of dominance, came to be completely replaced, or gradually replaced at least, by the evolving formations of capital. Capitalism at the time was not a bad word. Capitalism was rather considered to be a very positive word which stresses individualism and entrepreneurship, thereby creating a new kind of market economy. The landed aristocracy was gradually being shown the door. Although it did not live all at once, it still continued through the 17th and partially in the 18th as well. But however, the rise of capitalism had been a reversal of the feudalistic socio-political order in the sense it gradually began to pull down the medieval power relations based on landed aristocracy. So therefore, we gradually find that the Elizabethan period comes to be rather marked by a sense of democratic polity as well as public individualism, which is very clearly found. If we read it very carefully, it is very clearly found in Machiavelli's The Prince, where we find a distinctive ideological progress. So that's why Elizabethan period was confronting multifarious ideologies coming from many different areas. So it was not just a Concordia discourse as Tillier and others have said. It's not just a Concordia discourse. A homogenic, homogeneous, uh, monolithic form of unity. But rather, if we carefully consider the Elizabethan period and the European history as a whole, then you will find that there had been all the time constant struggles and factions. Right. So that's why when we come to the Elizabethan period, we find that we are standing at the crossroads of history. Now, we should also consider the new creative patterns and generic formations. Let us first of all consider the concept of love as such, because I will rather not take up many other areas because I'm um, going forward to the analysis of the sonnets. So let us consider the concept concept of love. Uh, in fact, the idea of love as an adventure, as an ideological adventure, as a theological journey, came to be discovered by the Neoplatonists, especially on the basis of their reading of Plato's Symposium and their essential dependence on the idea of creation as, as uh, substantiated by Aristophanes in his speech in Symposium. Not only Plato's Symposium or even Phidras, but also Dante's Vita Nova, a collection of lyrics, which means Vita means life, Nova means new, new life. So these are the two very seminal, I mean, books which created 
a new philosophical order for the examination of the concept of love. And also the influence of the Petrarchan poetic structure. So therefore three very important things. Number one, Petrarchan poetic structure. The Platonic ideological tradition as evident in Symposium. And finally, the wonder of love, the wide variety of love as projected by Dante in his collection of lyrics, Vita Nova. And also this emphasis on Oman Court, it should be very careful. We have seen in the sonnets and in the love lyrics of the Elizabethan period that there is an elevation, an escalation of the image of the lady love. I use the word image very consciously. The image of the lady love. The lady love is etherealized. The lady love does not belong to this our world. But what was the reason? There had been a very definitive philosophical reason behind this, which is linked with some distinctive ideologies of religion, Christianity. It has been pointed out by some critics that the the etherealization of womanhood is largely related to the concept of mariolatry, worship of Mother Mary. Apart from Jesus Christ, there had been also an interconnected vision of the godliness of the divinity of Mother Mary. That's called Mario Latri. Latri means worship. So worship of Mother, worship of Mary. As a result, it Mario Latri became a theological, a cultural principle, as well as a philosophical principle that transformed the ideological order and influenced the idolatrous imaging of women in poetry and drama. So we can see that philosophy, because if, when we try to read the sonnets, we have to consider the philosophical layers the socio-political layers, otherwise it's absolutely difficult to consider the nature. In fact, apart from this Mario Lettri, there had been certain other areas that we should try to consider. The, the breakdown of the mathematical order of Aristotelian philosophy in Europe. At that time, actually, things actually used to happen in Europe and England used to get the impact of those changes and transformations. So Aristotelian, I mean, ideology began to collapse in different European traditional universities and it began to be gradually replaced by the Christian order. If we believe in Aristotle's philosophy, then we have to believe in limitedness, in a fixed boundary of 
just remember those who have read um, Aristotle's poetics. You can see that you were always bound by a particular order. That's why it's beginning, middle, and an end. If there is no end, and if the beginning is not properly spelled out, Aristotle can never say that. Because his philosophical principle is a mathematical and a logical principle. Therefore, he cannot really envision such idea of a world which is unlimited in its vision. But Christianity had been challenging that. That's why in Christian tradition, there is always the question of foreshadowing, the question of looking back, the question of looking forward. There are two I introduced to the students, uh, two words. <clears throat> One is eschatology and another is teleology, philosophically. Eschatology, eschatas, means end. Logic, knowledge. Knowledge of the end. But knowledge of what kind of end? This is Aristotelian idea of the end. Right. What is that end? An end which you can see. An end which you can, I mean, organize. That's why when you read Homer's Sapi, for instance, Iliad, you find that it is, it begins in the last, it tells you, actually it was a, Mythically speaking, it was a 10 years battle, but in Homer Iliad, it is just the last year's battle. And some critics say that it is the last six months battle. But whatever it is, it is eschatological. It actually is limited in its time and in its place. The last year's battle, and if the battle is the city, and the, and the battle takes place in the city of Troy. So that is a scattered. <clears throat> Therefore, history, the vision of history becomes very limited in the Aristotelian tradition. And that actually creates a problem when he discusses the conflict between history and poetry. That's why history is inferior to poetry in Aristotelian analysis. Right. But not so in the Christian tradition. Virgil, who is considered to be uh, pre visualizing the Christian tradition, believes in the teleological ideology. Here also, teleology. Is telos means end, logos means knowledge, both means knowledge of the end. But here this telos is an unending end, an end that you cannot see. So that's why in the Elizabethan vision, history comes to have a moral vision, a vision which is found in Dante's another book called Monarchia, M O N A R C H I A, Monarchia, Kingship, and Aquinas's Diregno of the Kings. So the history of kingship is associated with a moral vision, it's not a political battle. So that's why Virgil, in his epic, again and again suggests or not suggest, he ex exhibits a sense of horror, a sense of horror with 
pure disorder and makes a celebration of creator piety. So therefore, in the in the Elizabethan world order, in the Elizabethan cultural tradition, what becomes very, very important is the Bhadus. The courage, the moral courage. And that's why when you read uh, the history plays in the Elizabethan period, you find that there is a quest for an ideal king. Now, it is through this that we find that Elizabethan period is gradually moving away from the restrictive vision of culture. That's why, you know, that the idea gradually comes to be a challenge to the classical tradition. That is, to, uh, Shakespeare may be regarded as the most significant writer who could very significantly and successfully challenge the classical tradition. Consider the comedy. We know that the classical tradition, especially the Italianate tradition of Plotus and Terence, came to be largely functional in the development of comedy. But Shakespeare was the first person to move away from the idea of classical comedy. In the Aristotelian analysis, what you see, you find that the comic characters are homoeus characters, meaning average characters, or foulous characters, below the average characters. So in Poetics, Aristotle suggests that the comic tradition is associated with the average characters or below the average characters. But what do we find in Shakespeare? In Shakespeare, we find just the opposite. He marks a breakdown of the classical tradition. In his comedies, we find the Spudaius characters, above the average characters. Consider, for instance, as you like it, Marchetta Venice, etc. You'll always find that he moves away from the classical tradition, takes over the Spudaius characters in his comedy. So, in this way, we find that in the tradition of poetry, especially in the tradition of, in the sonnet tradition, Shakespeare was largely influenced by the Petrarchan as well as the Dantesque tradition. And it actually created a new kind of creative experiment. And uh, there are so many things to say, but I'll just um, I'll just refer to only one or two points, and then move on to move on to I mean the uh, sonnets of Shakespeare. I will rather talk about the poetry love. We know that the sonnet tradition originated in Italy in the 13th century. Who was the first sonnet here? The students must know this. Giacomo do Lenteni, belonging to the Sicilian school of courtly poets of Emperor Frederick II. Now, this Giacomo do Lenteni is regarded as having evolved the sonnet form in the 13th century. 
But actually, at the same time, there had been another very distinctive influence coming from France. The Sicilian school, I mean, under the rule of King Frederick II, the Sicilian school was, of course, influenced by the love poetry of the French Provencal troubadours, the wandering poets of Provence, and uh, this, as a result, this actually developed this idea of the Provencal troubadours, the wandering singers. They actually made use of Occitan language, a language of southern France, and or Provence, a language of Provence in France, and other southeastern regions of France. So that's how we can see that there have been scattered, sporadic influences coming from France to Sicily to influence them to write sonnet proper. The central theme of the proposal to Badus was the celebration of chivalry, court Lila. Now, Giacomo was followed by, after Giacomo, a Giacomo, the Tuscan poet, Giton the Arzo, also tried to perfect the sonnet form. So, first of all, we find Giacomo the Lentini from the Sicilian school of poetry under the sponsorship of Emperor Frederick II, and also the sporadic influences coming from France, especially the Trubedos, Provosal Trubedos, and then the second, the Tuscan poet, Giotun Darezzo. So he is regarded, uh, Darezzo actually is regarded as having perfected sonic poem. He started as a secular love poet, but his sonnets began to be intermixed with religious power, especially, especially after his conversion in 1260. So it is in this way we find that it comes to be further re-experimented with by Guido Cavalcanti, who brought about intellectual perception and moral austerity into the sonnet form. This also comes to be further <coughs> developed by Dante in his Vita Nuova. Wonderful artistic and thematic excellence can be noticed in his sonnet tradition. And then comes Petrarch, the canzoniere, the songs and sonnets. And it has been again and again suggested that this new Gothic tradition was largely influenced by Neoplatonism and the form itself. We very often ask such questions regarding the form. We know that, generally speaking, it is divided into two parts, octave and sestate. The first eight lines are called octave and the last six lines sestate. And having some standard rhyme schemes, some I mean, departures from those rhyme schemes, more experiments have come on. But the octave, what is the essential purpose of the octave? The octave actually makes a statement of problem. It is a statement of problem followed by a sudden turn of thought, which is called volta. It's called volta. So the octave is a statement of problem. Followed by a sudden volta, a turn of thought that leads us to the sestet, the last six lines, which actually is a counter statement. So, therefore, we can see that there is a bipartite structure in a sonnet the statement and the counter statement. This bipartite statement is finally resolved into a distinctive conclusio, conclusion. So therefore, syllogistically, we can say that 
a sonnet has generally a tripartite division a proposition a proof followed by number three a conclusion so this is the general formative structure but sometimes we have another question in shakespeare sonnets we find rhyming couplets at the end now why is this shakespeare's use of rhyming couplet at the end of the sonnet may be regarded as a distinctive functional use as a distinctive functional use and it has a dual purpose number one a specific thematic emphasis and number two final conclusion so the last rhyming couplet in shakespeare therefore has two distinctive functions number one specific thematic emphasis and the final conclusion and uh, after this there's so many things to say but i think i will uh, now go into shakespeare straight uh, giving you some idea uh, i must not say that it's a very extensive idea but i've given you some sporadic ideas uh, before we approach shakespeare sonnets uh, we know that shakespeare was the son of a prosperous tradesman based on Stratford upon Avon, and he was born in 1564. I'm not going into the details of his life because it's available everywhere. You can read read about that. We know that he wrote 14 comedies, 12 tragedies, 11 history plays. Apart from that, some longer uh, plays and uh, longer poems and sonnets. And uh, in fact, he when he retired, he was financially very solvent. He actually made several real estate purchases in Stratford, including a large house in 1597. He purchased that. However, so it's not a very long life, perhaps 52 years, uh, but uh, still a wonderful, uh, wonderful dedication. To the cause of literary culture. Now, let me first of all begin with the sonnet sequence. In fact, you know, in the Elizabethan period, sonnet sequence emerged as a very distinctive poetic tradition, as a distinctive literary genre. And we have quite a number of instances. Number one, Philip Sidney's Astrophel and Scala, published in 1591. Then Samuel Daniel's Delia, published in 1592. Michael Drayton's Idea, published in 1593. Edmund Spencer's Amoretti, published in 1595. These are all, I mean, wonderful exemplar examples of this creative genre of sonnet sequence. Now, the problem with Shakespeare is this. Can Shakespeare's sonnets be called sonnet sequence? Can, can we, I mean, impose a very distinctive chronological and homology Homo homogeneous unity when you talk about his sonnets. There's a critic called John Blake. John Blake points us out that, a quote, in the order in which we have the sonnets, there is nothing like a predetermined overall unity of design. So he very point blank says that there's no overall unity of design. And in order to be a sonnet sequence, there should be this kind of, I mean, 
overall inuit have designed that is also the problem with uh, yes kenison's in memoria that same problem we say that we have numbers and one after another etc but critics have always questioned the chronology this homogeneous unity is very difficult which was later on questioned by the um, by the new historians like say stephen greenblatt he actually was very very much against such idea of homogeneity in a work of art especially in the elizabethan and the 7th century creative writings however this contention naturally leads us to the discussion on the composition of sonnets uh the first reference that we find is in francis mayer now we have all forgotten francis mayer but francis mayer actually wrote a wonderful book in his own time it was in 1598 and the book was called palladis kamia palladis kamia actually it was a wonderful experiment with the tradition of wit so in palladis kamia he adores i could mellifluous and honey tongued shakespeare and he praises again put sugared sonnets so very sweet sonnets from a mellifluous and honey tongued poet for shakespeare this was a very handsome tribute again in 1599 so that was in 1598 francis mayers first reference then in 1599 william jagard j a g g a r d uh please pardon me for one minute please Sorry, uh, there was someone a visitor. <clears throat> well i was talking about william jagard now william jagard published a collection of poems and it had a very wonderful curious kind of title which was really very very misleading the title of that was of that book was the passionate pilgrim by w shakespeare but actually these poems which were collected there were wrongly attributed to shakespeare only two poems were there by shakespeare others were not and these and shakespeare was perhaps very very much anguished and therefore he brought out a a text of his own in 1609 it was a quarto text of shakespeare and uh, he was perhaps anguished with the text published by jagard and felt the necessity of publishing an authentic text so therefore you can see that this sonnet sequence this idea of the sonnet sequence also is very very debated now shakespeare's reputation actually remained in his uh performance as a dramatist yet it is curious that shakespeare began to turn to poetry from 1599 hmm. as you find in evident uh, in such writers as francis mayer and others so it was of course a time when shakespeare actually made large investments in drama in public theater 
and he also got the membership of Globe Theatre, made investments here and there, but then came the plague. As we are all suffering from the pandemic. So this pand like this pandemic, there had been the plague. As a result, the theatres were closed up. Uh, from 1602 from 1603 to 1604 may 1603 to september september 1604 first the theaters were closed and, and then again after a brief intermission from july 1606 to december 1610 one minute please again one minute Yes, I'm really, I do apologize for these interruptions. So the plague had a tremendous impact at the time. The theaters were uh, all closed down. I can remember, it's a huge quotation, long quotation. But let me give you a test of that, how the contemporary writers looked at the, at the plague and the theatres being closed down. This is uh, by Thomas Decker. You have all heard about Thomas Decker. Now, Thomas Decker wrote uh, in his book, Work for Armors. He published the book in 1609. And in this book, he writes about the playhouses and the plague. He says, playhouses stand still, the doors locked up, the flags all taken down, and rather like the houses lately infected, from whence the affrighted dwellers are all play. Dorja bandho, utshaber kotaka itadi shab namano hega che, akta loko chaddi ke kothao nei, unar che shabai bhai paliye che. It's a long quotation. I just gave you a text. But perhaps because of this, the uh, that Shakespeare actually was working from home. So that's why he began to write sonnets, maybe. And you remember that the time when Shakespeare began writing the sonnets, the craze for writing sonnets was over. This is very interesting. Now, he turned to writing sonnets, but the Elizabethan craze for writing sonnets was already over by 1590. After the accession of James I in 1603, England actually entered into the second phase of English sonnet theory. Remember this. James I came to the throne, 1603, and by that time, the second phase of sonneteering started because the first phase of sonneteering was over by 1590. So to this second wave belongs the sonnets of Drayton, John Davis's Wheat's Pilgrimage, the Scottish poet William Alexander's Aurora, 1604, or Alexander Craig's three collections published between 1603 and 1609 and in fact shakespeare 
was gradually moving towards the end of his dramatic career. And he was trying his hand at writing longer poems like Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece, etc. And uh, some critics have even tried to suggest that some of the, I mean, some of the uh, plays were very much in the tradition of uh, creative poetry. That's why they mention such uh, plays like Love's Love is Lost, Romeo and Juliet, etc. But however, <clears throat> Shakespeare began writing the sonnets around 1593, kept adding to them, revising them for the first few years of the 17th century and put the finishing touches to the series just before their publication in 1609. This is the statement which comes from a very famous critic, Paul Hammond. Paul Hammond actually wrote a book called Shakespeare Sonnets, an original spelling text. There he makes this statement. So this is actually one side. While we try to make ourselves prepared for writing, for reading the sonnets of Shakespeare. But then we should also consider the triangle the addressee in the sonnets, the friend, the dark lady, and the rival poet. These are the addresses we have to consider. While we try to read the sonnets, we have to consider the nature of the addressee. In fact, by considering the nature of the addressee, we consider the relationships. Now, Shakespeare's sonnet sequence is largely different from other contemporary sonnet sequences in terms of the relationships and addresses posited in the poems. Most of the sonnet sequences, such as those of Sidney and Spencer, are addressed to an idealized woman, as we have seen. We have read the sonnets of Sidney, Spencer, etc. Everywhere you have seen that it is the it is the projection of an idealized womanhood, an idealized woman, and thereby creating always a dialectical tension, an opposition between the material and the spiritual, between the material and the ethereal. The essential themes always being complaint, separation, adoration, mixed with the Neoplatonic variations of romantic love, as emphasized in Shakespeare, Plato's Symposium and Phidias. So therefore, the addressee in the traditional sonnets is the idealized woman and the essential themes are complaint, separation, isolation, adoration, mixed with the principles of Neoplatonism. So this is what we find in the traditional forms of science. But Shakespeare introduces a distinct sense of complication by introducing a distinct departure from the earlier tradition in sonnets 1 to 126 we notice a male addressee while the rest of the sonnets 127 to 154 it concentrates on the woman commonly referred to as dark lady the poet the poet patron or friend and woman this is the triangle creating thereby a psychomachia, a psychological struggle, and another kind of tri a tri a triangle, the poet, patron, rival. So poet, patron, and the dark lady, poet, patron, and the rival poet. So in this way, there is constantly a complication. The earlier form of idealism of love has been replaced by 
apprehension, doubt, apprehension, questionings, oscillations of mood, complex forms of argument, dream visions, uh, ratiocination, so multiple aspects of themes. These variations are generated through the overarching presence of the friend, which lends, who lends dramatic complexity to the entire sonnet sequence. In terms of alternating emotions, the alternating emotions projected through the self, projected through the self, the blatant desires and apprehension. That's why the sonnets may be regarded as an implicit narrative of a relationship between two men and one woman. This is once again the statement of Paul Hammond. Paul Hammond says that it is an implicit narrative of a relationship between two men and one woman. However, <clears throat> the dedication of the first edition of Shifter Sonnets reads to the only begator of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W. H., all happiness and that eternity promised. This is very well known, the only begator of the sonnets. And in 1827, Wordsworth wrote a sonnet called Scorn Not the Sonnet. Scorn Not the Sonnets. There he says, Scorn not the sonnet critic, ye have frowned, mindless of its just honours, with this key, Shakespeare unlocked his heart. This is Wordsworth. Wordsworth says that with this key, he unlocked his heart. Very distinctively, a bioliterary form of criticism, which I don't accept. However, the statement of Wordsworth and later Oscar Wilde's, the portrait of Mr. W. H., possibly initiated the enthusiasm for constructing the biographical evidence based on the reading of his comments. For instance, the idea of Mr. W. H. Who is this W. H.? It also has become a matter of long debate. Let me just give you some ideas. Number one, it has been suggested by some critics that W.H. is no one but Shakespeare's brother-in-law, William Hathaway. Or, number two, it may be his nephew, William Hart. But there is no historical evidence for such claims. The most significant name that continues to be debated is that of Henry Riotsley. It has been suggested that this Henry Riotsley, the, uh, the third Earl of Southampton, and Shakespeare actually dedicated his poems Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece to him. So that's why sometimes it has been suggested that perhaps the dedicatee of the sonnets is perhaps Henry Riotsley. And this friend is therefore no other than Henry Riotsley. But, well, it may be true of his earlier, song, earlier poems, but not the sonnets. I will here depend on the statement of Peter Highland. He wrote a book called An Introduction to Shakespeare's Poems. Here he says, in 1598, Sadamton, Earl of Sadamton, married, that means Henry Riotsley, Married Elizabeth Vernon, cousin of the Earl of Essex, thus irritating the wrath of Queen Elizabeth. So you can see gradually there was a decline of the, the relationship between Elizabeth and Henry Deoxley, Deborah William Deoxley. So therefore, Three years later, he was implicated in Essex's doomed rebellion against the king 
and was sentenced to death. So Riyadhle was sentenced to death, but this was committed commuted to life imprisonment, and he was released when James the First came to the throne in 1603. But after that, Riyadhle actually was almost absolutely powerless, absolutely powerless, and he simply remain led his own life. and that's why we can say that shakespeare should not have dedicated his sonnets to someone caught in a millstone of political controversy so then another famous claim is wh for claim claim for wh is william harbert third earl of pembroke third earl of pembroke the household of pembroke had been quite famous for their patronage to authors it has been calculated by michael brennan that around 250 authors wrote dedications or literary tributes for the earl of pembroke and it has been also suggested that the poems that the sonnets 1 to 17 were written at the request of the countess of pembroke urging the earl of pembroke william harbert to marry the first 17 sonnets so that's why this seems to be a kind of legitimate claim but still it is not not very acceptable to go for a biolegitimate defense of shakespeare's sonnets that's why i would rather accept w j lever's argument given in the elizabethan love sonnets where he says that shakespeare sonnets and the projection of the figure of the friend should be regarded as part of the literary tradition and therefore the sonnets are chiefly recreative endeavors and therefore it should not be considered as as a biographical i mean it should not be considered in terms of a biographical interpretation of sonnets in fact it was very very much there in the tradition the adoration of the patron in the form of a male friend was not at all uncommon Spencer's adoration of the Neapolitan duke or Richard Bunfield's sonnets to a young man contained in Cynthia evidently show that the language of love used in Elizabethan sonnets were essentially generic that means it's part of the creative tradition there's nothing personal so um Stephen Ogle, in his introduction to Shakespeare sonnets, considers this as part of the cultural scene, and cites the example of King James's letter to his favorite, the Duke of Buckingham. He therefore comments the rhetoric of patronage and of male friendship generally was precisely a rhetorical, I mean, exaggeration of. a feeling of closeness so it was purely rhetoric there's nothing personal about it and then um well let me talk about some other things there are also very significant attempts made by the critics to identify the rival poets present in remember this 78 to 86 there we find his discussion or his references to the rival poets the poet gets very very disturbed because his patron is surrounded by other rival poets so it is very common for a poet to be disturbed by this because he thinks that the favors will go out of way so therefore therefore he comes to be rather very very annoyed 
with the rival poets. So therefore, this discussion is there in sonnets 78 to 86. The Francis Davison's name has been suggested as a possible rival by one critic called Henry Brown. Uh, but this possibility has been rejected by a number of scholars. While acknowledging this possibility, Kathleen Duncan Jones rather chooses to consider the rival poet not as a particular person, but as a composite figure. Many rival poets together projected as the image of one rival poet and mentions John Davis of Hereford, Samuel Daniel, George Chapman, and Ben Johnson as possible rival poets. Right. Now we come to the Dark Lady, as presented in sonnets 127 to 154. Students must remember these, I mean, clusters. Critics have suggested, having many others, two strong possibilities. One is Mary Fitton, and another is Emilia Lanier. Now, Mary Fitton had been the lady in one lady in waiting in the royal court of Queen Elizabeth, and William Harvard was scandalously involved with her and was consequently imprisoned. But Mary Fitton was not dark. But Emilia Len Lenier was dark because of her Jewish Italian origin. She was also brought up in an aristocratic family. But there is no possibility of linking her with the sonnets. That's why critics like Peter Highland points out that there is no compelling evidence for either case. It is therefore impossible to conjecture the possibility for Shakespeare to cross the social boundaries, get involved with a lady belonging to a much higher social category. That's why it is very, very difficult to identify even the dark lady. Now, in this way, we find that uh, Shakespeare has been trying to reverse the tradition. Uh, he again and again try to make the sonnets, sonnet sequence, very, very complicated by bringing about a triangle of relationships, by bringing about a wide very variety of moods. So that's why Shakespeare actually was creating a new kind of poetic tradition, I must say. That. And uh, I believe that um, Shakespeare actually has been working on this and I was looking at the syllabus of Bidashagur University. I'm not sure if I have uh, found out the right one, uh, but it is, I found it is CBCS and uh, I found that uh, sonnet number 130 is very much there. I must consider sonnet 130 as uh, a very important sonnet because uh, it actually um, is a wonderful satiric um, critic of the of the traditional tradition of the of the traditional projection of the lady love the idea of Mariolettery, the Sydney and uh, I mean uh, the, the kind of sonnet tradition that had been I mean established by uh, uh, Spencer and Sydney. Actually, it comes to be a distinctive criticism of that. That's why he one after another uh, creates a kind of catalog 
this is part of the classical rhetorical tradition catalog. Uh, the best example is found in uh, Aeschylus's play Agamemnon. The very beginning is conceived in terms of a catalog. That means many different items, all projected one after another. I'm not sure if uh, sonnet number 130 is there, but I just read the I syllabus and I found that it is there. So I'm just commenting on that often. But I have seen that the description of the hair, the description of the of the color of the skin, the description the description of the color of the skin, the description of hair, and all other componential features of a woman's beauty found in the traditional sonnets are cataloged here. Are cataloged here only to show, only to create a sense of parody only to create a sense of parity. So this actually is a very significant, a very significant, I mean, uh, way that Shakespeare is looking at the idea of Lady Love. He rejects the Platonic tradition. He rejects the Dantesque tradition. He actually moves away from the Petrarchan tradition and creates a tradition of his own. This is how Shakespeare actually has created a new kind of poetic form. And at the same time, you can see that Shakespeare has again and again in other sites. For instance, I was just looking at sonnet number 90, where he again and again is trying to consider the idea of time. Time takes away everything which is very distinctly taken from Ovid's declaration in Tristia, book 4, where he says, Tempore poenarum compensar to leonenum. Time the rage of lions is fettered. So therefore, a similar kind of thing is noticed in Spencer in his Amoretti, devouring time. So it is, it, is, it is this contentious relationship between time and mutability and art. And it is here, this is not normally mentioned by anyone. Actually, Shakespeare, I don't know knowingly or unknowingly, maybe knowingly, is using uh, the Aristophanic idea of creation as found in Plato's Symposium. Uh, Aristophanes gives us the idea of creation. How was man created? Woman created? Then he says that when man and woman were created, they were created as a sphere, as a sphere, a completeness, a complete union of the man and the woman. And God found that this sphere, as they are always together, mixed with each other, they have forgotten God. So that's why he cut them into two halves, two hemispheres. That idea of the hemisphere, the idea of the sphere that has been again and again 
recreated by Shakespeare onwards, even in Marvel, even in Dunn. So therefore, the two hemispheres, and as they are now separated, there is agony, there is despair, and it is as a result of that they will think about God. So that's why he says that this world will never perpetuate anything. It will always be subject to decay. And we suffer. Then what is the how how should we get this permanence? Then Socrates gives the resolution. Socrates says that it is only art. It's only art that can perpetuate. Something an idea, something of this kind of an idea was later on substantiated by Kitts. So therefore you can see that Shakespeare has been, I mean, again and again using all of these, all of these traditional, I mean, ideologies in his sonnets. Well, so I have actually, uh, I mean, meeting that is going to start very soon, but I have tried to give you as much as possible within the short time about the sonnets. Uh, for the students, let me tell you that I have first of all given you some background and you once again listen to the background from the YouTube link that will be perhaps provided to you. On the basis of that, you will be able to get to know about some of the features of the infant period and uh, try to read the sonnets against that background. And then come to the basic creative features of the PK. I've given some idea regarding that. And then I have come to Shakespeare. And I have taken up some problematic from that. And try to remember these problems and relate them to the sonnet that he will. But thank you very much for kindly for patiently bearing with me and I once again feel apologetic, feel, uh, I actually, I express my apology for being, no, no, sir, it's okay, sir, it's uh, okay, for coming it's to okay. your seminar so much late and again some interruptions here and there. No, no, sir, uh, it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, mesmerizing talk. It's a kind of, uh, treat to our intellectual mind, the way you have presented Shakespeare and Shakespeare's sonnets before us. So it will be an experience that you will treasure your know, mind forever. And it is always a pleasure to listen to you, sir. Uh, it's a kind of a uh, trick, I think, uh, to uh, many of us uh, down the memory lane. Memory lane. So now uh, with your permission, sir, uh, we will take questions if you permit. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, uh, so I'm just making it visible to your screen. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. <clears throat> A very interesting question. Uh, gender studies actually has come up. And you know that gender studies actually uh, is an inter interdisciplinary field and uh, naturally we may consider the fluidity of sexuality it's of course true uh, but it is ac actually very difficult to ascertain the nature of sexuality in the song because of the lack of evidence well, I have been looking at this, uh, you know, that this idea of male friendship, uh, the complication created by the presence of the dark lady, and again, the rival poets that also actually makes it a sort, makes it sort of gendered. Uh, all of these are very much there, but actually it's very difficult to ascertain, very difficult to ascertain, 
and very difficult to i mean very difficult to assert that this is the kind of relationship existing between this and that but there is of course um, indications of the fluidity of uh, gender consciousness uh, so that's why well the famous uh, sonnet sonnet number 18 master mistress of my passion that actually creates a confusion right at the same time he is asking the friend to marry and all that but whatever it is i am i believe i think that this kind of interpretation the gendered interpretation that may project a new approach of course to shake the sonnets different kinds of uh, complications are there and we know that it's crowded with some people is the poet who writes it is the poet who loves someone is the poet who admires someone is the poet who is afraid of someone that i will poet or the dark lady there's a woman the dark lady he is there as a very distinctive presence from 127 to 154 with multiple uh, multiple phases of emotional repercussions and the rival poets as i have said that it's not one rival poet perhaps it's a group of poets working as the image of one rival poet so therefore the rival poets their complications their association with the patron the patron himself he may be a lover he may be a friend he may be a patron so many kinds of images coming up so as i can see that's why i say that it's very crowded the whole scheme is very crowded not so much with other sonnets there's only the poet and the beloved but here it is crowded with so many ramifications yes that's why i say that yes uh, it may be gendered that may be gendered i mean a different kinds of sexuality so i'm open to that but well there is another question is the ending of shivna sort close final or is it open for further discussion uh actually you know this reminds me of uh, another remark it has been suggested although i don't agree but it has been suggested that shakespeare sonnets individual sonnets are not do not take us to any sense of finality because all the sonnets taken together should be taken as a drama all the sonnets taken together should be regarded as a dramatic piece so that's why you begin with sonnet number 1 and end with 154 and only then you can find out the meaning so therefore i just talked about this for my students for our students that it is closed or final yes that i talked about the rhyming couplet that's why i said that there is a distinctive kind of symmetric structure the proposition the proof and the conclusion and normally the conclusion comes up with the rhyming couplet but actually you know if you if you if you take the whole sonnets together then only the entire sonnet ramify the entire sonnet sequence ramifies itself leading to the final point right but if you take it as a single one then naturally uh there it ends and then would you please comment on the reason behind the unequal distribution of lines of
mostly there are 14 lines for some reason. Yes, actually uh, this uh, sometimes happens, you know. Yes, there are some poems which are of 10 or 12 lines. Um, for instance, let me give you an example. Uh, we know couplet. We know that there are couplets. Most of the late 17th and 8th and the 18th century poems were written in couplets. But then there had been also triplets. Triplets. So that's why you know that Shakespeare also is making use of the sonnet form generally, but he sometimes makes a distinctive creative experimentation with 10 or 12 lines because the purpose is over. Because what is a sonnet? Is it, it is a receptacle. It's a receptacle for containing a distinctive thought pattern. When the thought pattern is over, then there's no need to move beyond those lines. That may be one of the reasons. So that's why when Dryden made use of triplets in some of his poems, like Absalom and Architecture, or even Alexander Pope made use of triplets in the midst of all the couplets. Suddenly, he makes use of some instances of, in some instances, he makes use of triplets. Why? Because he feels that couplet is not enough. The theme of, the theme should be, should go beyond the two-line boundary. Similarly, he was possibly thinks that the message has been given and the ide uh, ideological pattern has been completed. So it's no use going beyond that. It may be one of the reasons. Yes, anything else? Thank you, sir. With this, uh, as I don't find the questions yes. uh, right now, so we will move towards our formal vote of thanks. And for this, I request our students, Ruchida. Uh, Ruchida, am I audible? So turn on your video. Yes. Hello, sir. So, uh, Am I audible? Yes. So yes. I request you the formal vote of thanks to us, uh, resource person, uh, Professor Devnan Mandapadai, sir. Okay, equal. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, yes. sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I, Ruchira De, a student of Minapur College Autonomous on behalf of our English department, would like to thank would like to uh, pay my uh, pay si uh, sincere gratitude to our honorable guest, Dr. Dev Narayan Gangapadhyay, who has blessed us uh, today with his enlightening speech on the topic Shakespeare's sonnets and introduction. I would also like to convey my gratitude to our respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera, and our um, honorable uh, sir tonmoy kundu sir for uh, making such a great effort to arrange this amazing online lecture series last but not the least i would also like to thank all the participants my fellow mate and the guest for spending their valuable times and for being with us so that's all sir have a good day sir thank you sir thank you Yes. Shona Jatsena. Yes, uh, actually, sir, after a vote of thanks, there should not be any questions, but uh, one student is asking repeatedly. Yes, so, yes. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, it's very difficult, but uh, let me tell you, you should read the sonnets prescribed in the university as i can see in uh Vidyashagur university i'm i don't know if i'm correct in Vidyashagur university i found that only sonnet number 130 is there at the ma uh, in the honors but i believe that in the ma possibly there are more sonnets and uh, you should also 
uh, consult the syllabus of Badwan, Calcutta, Jadapur, and see the. You will see that most of the sonnets are there in your syllabus. So those are the representative sonnets. So read these representative sonnets. Right? You get my answer. So that means you will have to read some ten to twelve sonnets if you consult the syllabus of some other universities like Calcutta, Jadapur, Vardhaman, etc. And your own, of course. What is it? Uttar Pagach. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving us this precious time out of your busy schedule, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. We can uh, end the session here now.